Welcome to Platypus PowerShell Help Meets Markdown talk. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, we have a lot of great talk going on. Uh, so just quick introduction about myself. My name is Sergey. I uh, work for a couple years on the PowerShell team. Currently I work at Dropbox uh, as a software developer. Uh, and in PowerShell community I was working on a few projects you may see in my avatar. Uh, it's PowerShell open source project itself. It's Platypus, which we will talk about today. Uh, and a couple of small pet projects, Zlocation and uh, Sublime PowerShell Grammar, which is used by GitHub for syntax highlighting as well. <clears throat> so let's talk about GetHelp. How many of you use GetHelp? Okay, everybody, great. Yes, because GetHelp is awesome commandlet that everybody learn when they learn PowerShell. Uh, it's like, you know, probably one of the top three commandlets that people told you to start use. Uh, and that's basically the way how we figure out how to use our commandlets. <clears throat> so that's how it looks like. You know, you just uh, get some nice uh, structured output, a name, syntax, aliases, remarks, uh, parameters, and whatnot. But how, <clears throat> how actually uh, you get this output? If you module after, you want to provide uh, help with your module, and uh, you have a couple options to do that. The first option is uh, if you're writing a script-based module, you can use a command-based help in the script. It looks like this. So you, ha you can have a structured command uh, with uh, sections like synopsis, description, and uh, everything else. Uh, and uh, it's very natural to read it, it's very natural to write it. And uh, it's probably one of the most popular ways to provide uh, documentation and help for your modules. <clears throat> the next option is uh, somewhat specific to binary modules, basically the same thing, but for binary modules. Uh, binary is modules you write in some .NET language, most likely C Sharp. Uh, they look very similar again, uh, they use XML tags instead of uh, this dot synopsis and dot description. Uh, but uh, again, you know, it's, it's maybe a little bit less readable by just the naked eye, uh, but pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> the third option is called MAML XML. So let's, like, how many of you wrote MAML XMLs in your life? Okay, one hand. <laughs> Half hand. <laughs> okay, so let's break it down. Uh, great you come to the talk. Glad to, I think we will learn a lot of cool stuff today. Uh, so MAML stands for Microsoft Assistant Markup Language, and XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. So we have Markup Language twice. Uh, and uh, this is how it looks like. Oh, no, that's not how it looks like because it can't be load. Because MAML XML files are usually really gigantic files, uh, many, many megabytes of text. Um, basically, imagine something like uh, Azure PowerShell module, which has uh, hundreds and hundreds of commands. And all the help for all these commands is crumbled into one file. So it's a lot of content. And uh, for example, the, this is a view on GitHub. Uh, GitHub cannot handle it. But I got it covered, so this is how it looks like if you open it in a text editor. Uh, if you cannot read it, it's okay. I will just tell you what the colors mean here. So the red one is XML text. Uh, the white one is actual content that you know, people wrote. Uh, and uh, yellow and green is a key value pairs for a bunch of metadata. So let's have a good mix of all of them. <coughs> this is like imagine now writing it by hands. You know, it's pretty overwhelming task. And uh, MAML XML is not very popular among the uh, like, you know, one person projects. <clears throat> uh, you need the special tooling to create it. And uh, we will address it a little bit later, but just let's make a note that 
you know, it's pretty hard to just like open the text editor and start writing mumbo XML help. Um, but it actually has a uh, advantage of a command-based help and uh, uh, our command-based help. Uh, advantage is uh, that it's a separate file. You ship it together with your module. Uh, Mumble-based help also known as external help. It's external because it's outside of your code. So let's say if you're a big company like Microsoft or VMware, then you can hire a team of tech writers and then can, then can collaborate uh, on the uh, documentation without involving your source code, and so they don't actually mess up with the development process, and it's nice. Um, it's also the only uh, way to provide help that allows you to uh, ship more than one language. If you have, if you have like requirements to have English version and German version, you basically have to use um, uh, MAML-based help for that. Because in the code, you can only have you know, one language. Uh, and uh, another type of help that uh, not often talk about is uh, websites. So when PowerShell was created 10 years ago, it probably wasn't that hot. But now people don't like to read uh, text in the command line that much. People like to just go to Google and find the help on the internet. So uh, websites is uh, something that people build completely separately out of, uh, co completely separate from uh, get help. Uh, and essentially, if you want to have a good online presence, if you want to have a website, and you want to uh, provide help for your module, uh, what you do is like you build two different documentations. And now they can get, get out of date. You now need to have like all kind of stories for consistency between them. And it's just uh, a lot of additional work. Uh, I just want to point out like this is example from Google's uh, Google Cloud commandlet, uh, get uh, GC disk. Uh, so they use nice uh, tables for metadata. They use uh, uh, different uh, syntax highlighting. They use hyperlinks. And uh, you can't really get that stuff in your console. You, you really need a web technologist <coughs> to surface it. <coughs> so to recap, uh, we have different uh, types of help. Uh, Command-based help is very easy to write and uh, intuitive, and uh, it's very popular. Uh, it's easier than MAML. MAML has a MAML has its own advantages if you have requirements for multiple languages, if you have requi requirements for update help. Update help basically allows you to host uh, archives <coughs> of a newer version of a help on a website and uh, bring them down with update help. Uh, but uh, none of the existing solutions uh, actively address the problem of creating websites separate from the get help content itself. So with that, I would like to talk a little bit about my personal experience with uh, PowerShell help. Uh, my first project when I joined PowerShell team was uh, Azure DSC extension. So Azure DSC extension is an uh, um, Azure marketplace application, I guess. It contains of two parts. The first part is a server. Uh, it lives in the virtual machine, and uh, users install it separately by checking checkbox or by running commandlet. <laughs> and it has a client part in the form of few commandlets in Azure PowerShell module. So Azure PowerShell module is uh, open source, uh, hosted on GitHub by Microsoft. Um, probably one of the first big uh, PowerShell-related open source projects. So to implement DSC extension, uh, what we did is we add a few commandlets into Azure PowerShell. It took a few months, and uh, we figured it all out. But uh, then after some time, we actually found that uh, we forgot to add help. So it wasn't good, and <laughs> we need to fix it quickly. Um, that's how I started to basically learn and think about the 
uh, what's the documentation story in PowerShell. The workflow was like the following. Uh, Azure PowerShell use MAML XML. So they have this one file that can be loaded on GitHub from the previous slide. Uh, there was no specified workflow anywhere in documentation re repository. Uh, and basically, you just need to figure out for yourself how you want to approach it. So, uh, as I mentioned, to edit with MAML XMLs, we can uh, pick up some tools. I know about free tools, maybe there are more. Uh, one of them is internal Microsoft tool. Uh, it's very nice, it, it can connect to a database and uh, you can collaborate with other people by using the database as uh, storage. But it was internal and uh, it, you know, it doesn't fit the bill of like, working in the open uh, with community. So the next tool is a Sandcastle. Uh, Sandcastle is a free, um, free project. Uh, stands for, it's, its name is actually not Sandcastle. Its name is uh, Sandcastle Help File Builder. Uh, SHFB, <laughs> but I will just say Soundcastle for simplicity. Um, the workflow looks like this, and basically that's true for all the uh, available tools. Uh, you import your module uh, from XML form uh, into some internal representation inside the tool. Then you have nice UI with Windows uh, where you can edit it, you can add new parameters and no, new commandlets. And then the last step is basically export. So it was pretty painful export for the following reasons. Uh, internal representation of this XML basically forgot all the formatting and uh, all white spaces get replaced by tabs or vice versa. Uh, all the text formatting changed, like indentations, and uh, you know, in one place this indentation was one way, and now it was another way. Uh, in XML, you can have commands, so commands wasn't preserved. And uh, as a result of all that, if you just take the diff and uh, submit pull request to Azure PowerShell, they will have a really hard time reviewing it because you have a mix of formatting changes. Some, some, some good formatting changes, some bad formatting changes, and some actual content that you add. So it just puts a bunch of burden on the maintainers who needs to separate all these things and uh, you know, give you go or no go. On top of it, they cannot use web interface because this file is so gigantic, so they need to find a ways to review it locally, and it's a whole another story. Okay, so we have this problem of um, Mm, not preserving the formatting. Uh, basically, the best solution I found was to open original file in a text editor, open new generated file in a text editor, and uh, find the corresponding block and uh, like drag and drop <coughs> selection and uh, just copy it. Uh, that works, but it's pretty error pruning and it's like not fun unless you're think it's fun, and uh, I, I had a really hard time, and a uh, few times I actually uh, had a problem that, uh, you know, I forgot some tag in one place, so now XML became invalid, and uh, there is no good way to test that it's valid or invalid and, until you load the uh, help in get help, and then you see that nothing displays. Uh, so that's pretty, like, that's a lot of process around uh, simple changes in documentation. Okay, I, I hope I convince you that we need a better story for all that. <coughs> so let me introduce Platypus. It's a project that basically tries to solve all these problems I just outlined. So we have two parts of equation. We want something for the web uh, and we want something that can be consumed by help engine. And uh, ideally, we basically just want one source for all that to avoid doing duplicated work or some synchronization. Um, the help engine part, we basically have two options. We can provide command-based help, or we can provide MAML XMLs. 
because, okay, so one of the approaches to solve it would be to have some third format, not website, not uh, command-based help, but something separate from them, which is easy, can be turned into the website and can be turned into the uh, help engine help, uh, consumable format. Um, okay, so with that motivation, uh, it's probably no surprise that uh, command-based help is out of the table because if you want to just generate something, uh, it would be really hard to insert it into the code that already exists. So MAML XML fits the bill perfectly. Uh, we basically just start to treat our XM, uh, MAML XMLs as a kind of binary, if you wish, like you know DLL that you compile, and you just have this uh, build step when you generate the help out of something like some third format. <laughs> Uh, and this third format, uh, because we want a website as well, it should be something very close to the web technologies. So people build uh, websites for a long time, and uh, you know, the, basically the amount of people who build websites is pretty big. It's bigger than PowerShell community. So they actually create a bunch of nice tools for doing that stuff. One of the problems with just writing raw HTML is that it's not very scalable, it's just cumbersome, so people actually don't write um, raw HTML by hands anymore. Uh, one of the approaches to create a static web content is to use a markup language. And uh, one of the very popular markup language is Markdown. <coughs> uh, yes, so, and then we come to a demo. So, uh, Platypus, okay, let, let's get back. <laughs> uh, basically, Platypus allows you to take a markdown and uh, turn it into MAML XML, which can be later consumed by the help engine. Uh, and because it's uh, just a markdown, then the web st website story is already solved. You can just uh, turn it into a website and uh, there are plenty of uh, existing tools to do that. So, yes, now demo time. Um, I will show you the markdown and uh, the result in XML. Okay, so, is the font size okay? <clears throat> Okay, so we start with just importing Platypus into a session. And um, I wanted to show, uh, I already prepared the markdown, and uh, this is how it looks like. And you can see that it basically loosely resembles uh, the output of get help with some fancy block at the top, but let's ignore it for now. Uh, and uh, then, you, like I guess, you know, if you're familiar with get help output, you can basically figure out how it's structured. Uh, there are some fancy uh, backticks here and there, some hyperlinks and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, let's just take a look at how it will look like when you render it as HTML page. Uh, so Visual Studio Code has this nice feature, uh, pre Markdown Preview. And uh, basically that's what we will get if you just turn this Markdown into HTML. So you get like headers, you get hyperlinks, uh, you get uh, code snippets, uh, and uh, all that good stuff. Uh, so this is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, looks very good. And you can put it on the internet and people, people can <coughs> consume it. It's maybe not as fancy as Google's version, which has tables, but uh, it's pretty decent. Uh, so now, like I showed you first part of equation, 
uh, let's take a look at the second part of it. Uh, how we take this markdown and turn it into uh, get help. So I picked uh, <laughs> new external help markdown as example because uh, we, will, we will basically use new external help on new external help to produce some output. Uh, yeah. So let's actually first take a look at all the commandlets that are available in Platypus module. So there are like about 10 of them. Uh, and uh, the core, like the heart of the whole module is this new external help. The turning markdown into the help XML is actually the hardest part in all that. So let's give it a try. Uh, so we can provide path to new markdown. Uh, a new external help MD. And we can say output path uh, out. Uh, we just need to give it a directory. It can exist, it may not exist, it will create it for us. And uh, we get an output. So let's take a look at this file. So this is XML, you can see, and um, it, it basically has all the content uh, that we wanted. So we can just take this XML, ship it with our module, and uh, we are done. Uh, actually, give me a second. Oh yeah, I forgot to show one more cool thing. Uh, so I just show the XML, uh, but uh, it would be really nice to know how this XML will look like when it's outputted by get help. Uh, so for that, we have another commandlet in the toolbox, uh, get help preview. Uh, get help preview takes path parameter to, to a file uh, and uh, it outputs what the get help will output on the, like if you use this file as a help, basically. So let's scroll it up a little bit and uh, take a look at all this stuff. So the name, synopsis looks good. Let's just, uh, you know, kind of spot check that we have the same content here and in the original markdown. Uh, so I just use search. Okay, sure enough, basically output path looks like this here, and it looks like this here. Uh, and uh, that can be applied not only to a single commandlet and single file, but it can be applied at scale. Uh, let's actually take a look at this guy. Uh, I have I have uh, platypus docs um, directory with uh, basically like kind of doc fooding all the documentation for platypus itself. So let's turn all this documentation into an uh, XML file. So it thinks a little bit longer. And now it outputs uh, just a single XML for all the help. And uh, it also outputs about topic, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, actually, I think, yeah, that's right. Time to talk about about. Uh, so uh, how many of you wrote about topics in PowerShell? Okay, so they are less popular, yeah. Like we can see it's less popular than like traditional help. Uh, and uh, I will just demystify them a little bit. Uh, basically about topics, let's take a look at the, this one, about TXT. Uh, so this is, I mean the, the extension TXT is no joke, it's really text file. There is no formatting whatsoever. So all these crazy XMLs I showed 
for the commandlet uh, based help for the XML help, uh, they're not applicable for the uh, about topics. Basically, about topic is just a text file. So it's pretty easy to just go and write it by hand, no problem. Uh, but as, like, as soon as we start to talk about the story of having a website, it would be nice to incorporate about topics in the structure of our website. So we can have same formatting, same, same hyperlinks and everything. Uh, you know, cross-reference topics in, from about into the commandlets and vice versa, and just have like a um, solid story for all types of PowerShell help. Uh, yeah, but by the way, about topics can be accessible if you do about help, uh, about, oops, something like this, about platypus, for example. It basically just outputs this text file. <coughs> Um, and uh, let's take a look at how Platypus handles about topic creation. Oh no, this demo is a little bit later. But that's fine, let's do it now. It's a pretty short demo, just one line. Um, so to create a new about topic, what we do is uh, we need to uh, call new markdown about help, and we need to pass uh, about name parameter, and in this case I will use greeting. Okay, it will make sense after the second demo, why greeting? <laughs> uh, and uh, let's take a look at what we output in uh, about greeting markdown. So what we output is, uh, you know, looks like markdown and there is a, just a bunch of placeholders that you need to fill up. Mm -hmm. But once you do it, you can use uh, the same new external help commandlet to trans, uh, translate markdown into the text file that you can ship with your module. All right, so let's get back to presentation. Uh, so, to talk about Platypus, we first need to talk about Markdown. Uh, how many of you use Markdown? Okay, so almost everybody, most people. Uh, for uh, Let's give it a 60 seconds refresher. So one of the beautiful things about Markdown is that it's so natural and so easy to learn that you really need only like 60 seconds to pick it up. So here we go. Um, this is the basics of Markdown. Uh, we have a line, we have another line. If we have only one line break between them, they will form a paragraph. So uh, it, line break kind of serves as a space. Uh, if you do two line breaks, you start a new paragraph. Uh, for headers, we use a hash. So if you have one hash, it will be header level one. If you have two hashes, it will be header level two. Um, for bullet point lists, we use dashes, or also asterisks. Uh, and for numbered lists, we use uh, one dot, one dot, one dot. You can also use one dot, two dot, three dot, but it's uh, not necessary. It will automatically numerate it for you. For hyperlinks, we use this syntax with uh, square brackets and brackets. And for code snippets, we use uh, triple backtick, and uh, there is a uh, non-mandatory language specifier. So if you want to have a syntax highlighting in the snippet, you can actually say in what language it is. So that's pretty much markdown for you. Uh, if you want to recap at home, there is a great resource. Uh, we've learned markdown in 60 seconds. Uh, it's a common mark.org help. They also have a 10 minute version of, of the same tutorial with more details. And now <clears throat> we can actually uh, take a look at more demos. So now we know markdown 
the question, the natural question to ask is, okay, who will write all this markdown? Like so far, what I tell you is, uh, hey, I came up with this format for help, and now everybody should start using it. But that's not how it works because people already using some tools, they created documentation in command-based help in MAML. Uh, so just by ju just to ask everybody to start to use Markdown for help uh, is not a very clever thing because it, it's a lot of work to create it. So to address this problem, we actually have uh, helper functions to bootstrap all your Markdown documentation. Uh, so here is, I just have a kind of hello world function, very small. <clears throat> Let's go through it very quickly. Uh, we have a parameter block, we have commandless bindings, which, we, which means that we have advanced function. Uh, so we have things like, you know, common parameters, uh, out variable and all that stuff. Uh, we have one parameter in parameter block with uh, mandatory set to true and value from pipeline set to true. Uh, the name of parameter is name and it does very useful process block here. Uh, so let's give it a shot and uh, try it out. Uh, new greeting. Okay, so that works. And uh, let's just test out the uh, piping from uh, pi pi piping, just piping. Uh, well, it's not get greetings, it's new greetings. Okay, that also works. Cool, so let's say I want to create a help for this uh, commandlet. Um, all I need to do is use new markdown help commandlet and uh, specify command name. So command should be in the in the, in the PowerShell session already. And uh, yeah, we have tab completion here, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, we need to specify output folder. So let's use our out folder where we put all the stuff. And uh, it just output it the markdown. So let's take a look at what did it output for us. So we again have this metadata block, let's ignore it for now. Uh, and uh, then we have a name of commandlet, we have synapses, uh, and uh, here we have a first placeholder, which tells us fill in the synapses. And uh, let's actually just search for all the placeholders in this file. So in Platypus we use a double curlies for the placeholders, and there are like five of them. Uh, unfortunately, like Platypus cannot read your mind, so it cannot fill up with uh, text fields for you. Uh, but, you know, it's still much easier to just go and fill up five fields than to write a whole XML. Uh, so let's actually uh, populate these placeholders. I will just copy paste some descriptions. to avoid typing on the demo. So for example, we will use, uh, we put help, uh, we put the code here and uh, you can see that it has the, this uh, triple back ticks PowerShell which means that the whole thing would be syntax highlighting as PowerShell. Um, I really like when people in the uh, examples in the help put the output of the help as well as the command. That's very useful. So let's actually do it. It's just a good practice. I will just copy this output. And now I have uh, two choices. Uh, if I just put it like, like this, uh, the whole output would be highlighted as PowerShell, which is not exactly what we want because it can be some arbitrary text. So uh, to avoid doing the highlighting on the second part, we can just break this 
code snippet into two code snippets, and then the first part would be treated as uh, input and the second part as output. Okay, so we need to provide the description, for example. Okay, and we have spell checker saved us. Uh, and uh, the last placeholder we need to populate is name. Uh, let's just double check that we don't have any more placeholders. Yeah, we don't have any more placeholders. Uh, and let's take a look at these uh, parameters, uh, at this parameter metadata block. Uh, so you remember that uh, our name parameter was a required parameter and it's already says required true. Uh, it also has accept pipeline input set to the proper value. So that all, all that stuff we get for free just by running new markdown help. Uh, we don't need to touch this metadata block by hands. Like all we need to do is just r go and write the uh, strings, like create some valuable content that cannot be after generated for us. And we have this common parameters because it's advanced commandlet. Okay, so now uh, let's see, can we turn this markdown into uh, external help? Are we already familiar with new external help? We give it, actually, uh, yeah, that's fine. New external help, uh, let's give it path out uh, new greeting. And uh, as output path, uh, I will use NUS. So that way I will just put it in the default locale and uh, later PowerShell help system can pick it up from this NUS folder. Uh, so now what we need to do to see this help live from get help, we just need to reload the module. Uh, so zero to greeting. And we need to use force for that. And now if I just say get help, new greeting, uh, I should, oops, let's use full. I should see all the content we just after it right here. We have the example, we have uh, synopsis and everything else. Okay, so the next demo was about, which I already showed. Uh, and uh, now let's take a look at uh, doing the same thing, but at scale. Uh, so I just found this in GitHub issue. Oh, man. oh uh, can you tell me the password? Summit uh, it, it, Summit. Yeah. Man, I, I knew I forgot something. Uh, and that was Wi Fi for the demos. It was great. Let's try it one more time. Okay, cool. And uh, is the size good? So uh, this is uh, just a PowerShell module for Atlassian uh, that allows you to automate Jira. And basically uh, they talking about, hey, let's migrate our documentation to Markdown. Let's migrate it to Platypus. And uh, this issue was filed in July 2017. So let's see how long it takes to migrate the help. Uh, we have Jira, oops, Jira PS here, so let's import it. Uh, Jira. PSD1. So it's load everything. Uh, let's take a look at all the commands in this module. 
there are a fair number of them. Um, and now we can just say new markdown help. And uh, I will use another variant, uh, not just a command, but the module. And uh, we have type completion for modules as well. And uh, as output folder, let's use something like out2. And it just starts to pop out all this uh, markdown for all these files. So I don't know, it took like 30 seconds to basically bootstrap uh, help for this big module. Now let's take a look at the uh, result of this bootstrapping. Uh, so we, because uh, Atlassian already had a uh, com command-based help for these modules, uh, synopsis, we don't need to populate it, it's already there. And uh, same goes for everything else. We already have examples, we already have uh, parameters, descriptions here, and everything in between. Uh, you know, look, if you start go through all this generated markdown, what you will find very soon is that at some point uh, there is no documentation. So we again get in the same placeholders uh, and uh, this is basically a good way to make sure that you have all documentation. Uh, like if, even if you're using command-based uh, documentation, you can just run Platypus and then search for all placeholders. And if, they're not, if there are no placeholders, then that means that you covered everything. And if not, then you can just go and add this help. So that was bootstrapping for uh, Jira module. <coughs> uh, now uh, we already covered uh, just plain markdown. And I uh, showed you how you can use Platypus to generate markdown and how this Platypus to generate help out of markdown. Uh, and uh, now we can talk about the markdown that is specific to Platypus. So markdown is as I mentioned, a, a really great, uh, easy to learn markup language. Uh, but it has this unfortunate property that any valid text, a, any text is basically a valid markdown. So, you know, that kind of a problem because uh, you cannot expect uh, Platypus to just magically figure out what did you mean uh, from some abstract markdown document you need to comply with a schema. And Markdown doesn't have schema built in. Like, unlike uh, things like JSON and XML where you can specify schema uh, and validate against the schema, Markdown doesn't have such thing. But we need it because that's how the tool can, you know, know that this synopsis thing is, uh, corresponds to synopsis. So the schema lives in this, uh, um, basically, the, the development of Platypus happens in this PowerShell Platypus uh, repository on GitHub. And uh, there is a top level file, Platypus Schema MD, which kind of goes into all the like, very subtle details that you may want to know one day. Uh, but uh, now we're not going to go through it. What we will do instead, we will just look at examples. So, because as I said, uh, Platypus schema is modeled uh, uh, after the get help output. So basically, if you know get help output, you should be able to just pick it up. Uh, the first thing is name. And for name, we use a header level one. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> for synopsis, we use a level header two for, names, for the word synopsis. And then the text block that goes after it becomes the synopsis. Same goes for description. And uh, here you can see an example <coughs> of using bold, I didn't, I didn't mention it on my 60 seconds intro about Markdown, but when you have uh, double asterisk, it's a bold in Markdown. And uh, you can see example of uh, using some 
uh, rich formatting in the markdown, which later just strips out during the translation. So, you know, again, to the common theme of uh, having the same source for both uh, get help and the website, you, you don't need to compromise for that. <clears throat> and you can still use rich formatting. Uh, the next one is examples. So examples is a section that contains subsections. Basically, how many examples you have, you just put them as a subsections, and they become uh, header level three with three hashes at the beginning. Uh, so the title becomes a title, and we automatically pad it with dashes, um, which is actually very nice because it's one of the many inconsistencies in existing PowerShell documentation. Uh, these dash, this, uh, dashes, you don't get them for free from get help. You actually need to write them down in your XML to get it uh, look nicely. Uh, then we have a, a code snippet block fenced by triple backticks. And uh, as I mentioned, you can break it down into two pieces. You can break it into the... Um, into the code snippet and the code output. So in this case, we actually didn't do that. We just put everything without syntax highlighting. Uh, and then the text after the uh, block becomes a description of example. So parameters is again contains of multiple subsections. Every command, uh, every parameter gets its own section. Uh, its name starts with dash, the same thing as in get help output. And uh, let's take a look at the uh, metadata part. I, when, when I circled here, oh, you see it, cool. So this metadata, it's actually, you can see it's breaked by new line break. Uh, and uh, the second half is just completely the same as uh, parameters metadata here. Uh, then type, string, uh, string array in this case, uh, it basically comes from the type string and parameter. Uh, and uh, alias, this is actually something that's not shown by get help for some reason, but it's good to have. Uh, alias is for parameter. And uh, the last one is parameter sets name, uh, parameter sets list. And uh, you wouldn't find the direct correspondence <coughs> into get help output because get help. Uh, uses syntax block to provide information about the parameter sets names. Uh, but it was just easier to basically put everything into one place in parameters. Uh, and uh, the syntax block actually brings us into taking a look at the syntax block in Platypus. So the important thing that a lot of people miss is uh, Syntax block in Platypus um, is uh, view only. It's kind of like read once and forget. So it's not used as a part of a new external help generation. Uh, all the metadata already present in parameters block. So uh, syntax block really exists only for the online, uh, like for the website purpose there. So you know, you, like, you, you never need to edit it by hand. So it will be always just after generated for you. Uh, the next field is input-output. <coughs> Again, very self-explanatory. You can have multiple of them. You can have uh, multiple level free headers. And uh, the last one is related links. <coughs> so the related links is usually at the bottom of your help. Uh, and uh, you can see that just normal markdown links get translated into uh, kind of key-value pairs in PowerShell and the PowerShell version has uh, one additional link at the top, online version. Um, so this is not very well known, <clears throat> but when you run get help dash online, uh, what happens is uh, help system looks into all the links you have and it opens the first one. So we kind of decided that it's better to, have, to be more explicit about this. So that's why we put online version in this top level metadata to make it more obvious how it works. Uh, and uh, what is, like, let's talk about this top level metadata. 
Basically, in Markdown, there is a standard extension which allows you to put uh, YAML, any arbitrary YAML file at the top for the metadata purposes. Uh, we kind of use in poor man's, poor man's version of it. We just use k-value pairs. We don't support the full YAML, uh, but that's enough for our uh, goal. Uh, and uh, it has four, um, four fields that Platypus understands. External help file, module name, online version, and schema version. Uh, you can put more stuff there. It's basically just a back of key value properties. And uh, the reason is uh, people want to build, like Microsoft, for example, they want to create some workflows for the documentation, and they need some inventory to reference to topics, and they put some GUIDs with some names and maybe language moniker and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, that part can be basically used to, for your own workflows, for your own customizations. Oops. Oh, I need to update my job. Uh, should I pick this? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Mark, man. Okay, so uh, life cycle. Uh, basically, let's say you write your module, you write your documentation once, and then six months later, you actually want to edit it. And this is very common, basically, the uh, modules are not static things you created once, it's a living, breathing being. Uh, so what kind of modifications do we usually see? People add new commandlets, People add parameters to existing commandlets. Uh, people add new functionality, and this functionality requires new uh, examples in the docs. Uh, and like parameters get renamed, and uh, just some alias get added. So that would be great if we can have a good story about how you can update your module with, uh, how you can update your uh, help with your module. And uh, now I will just show you just that. Okay, so this is actually a folder. <clears throat> Let's take a look at it. Uh, we have a PSM1 file. And it's basically our old friend, new greeting. Nothing unexpected here. Uh, but let's say that uh, after some time, I decided that it's a good idea to add a new parameter. Uh, and instead of just having hard-coded hello, I, I now want to have a greeting verb. I guess it's greeting noun. Uh, and uh, now my process block just becomes beautiful concatenation of three strings. Uh, so let's copy it into the greeting update. Uh, I will just show you git diff. So uh, this is basically a diff of my change. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at help for this command now. So I import in module update, oh, read update. So now uh, let's take a uh, let's verify that we have a new version of a module loaded, greeting uh, name and uh, greeting one, two, three, okay, great greeting. Um, so yeah, we have an updated version of a module loaded, uh, but uh, in our docs folder right here, we have an old version of documentation. So let's take a look at it. Uh, it's old because we, in the Parameters section, we only have name, but we don't have greeting. So this is a situation you very commonly find yourself in. Uh, all you need to do is simply 
run, one command, update, markdown, help. And then you just pass path to a folder with all your documentation. And voila, we just get a new parameter here. And this green uh, stripe at the left basically indicates that it's addition. Uh, and uh, we also get uh, the same thing into the syntax for free. So you never, like, you add parameter, you don't need to edit it. Just takes care of. Uh, all you need to do is now provide description. Uh, now we, um, we can create uh, external help out of it and load it into the module the same way I already showed. Yeah, that, that will be, let, let's actually try it. Um, that's a great example. <coughs> like this, right? Uh, okay, so that didn't work. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe it's actually Visual Studio Code. Let's reload it just to make sure. Uh, oh, I didn't reload. Yeah, that's a good catch. Nice. Uh, that should work. Like, you know, if it doesn't work, it means we have bug, and we have bugs sometimes. Yeah, so it did update. So essentially, uh, you don't need to ever touch this metadata block. You know, it's already automated for you. Uh, there is one caveat, actually. I will, I will give it up. <laughs> uh, you see how we have greeting equal hello. So we actually have default value for greeting. But uh, there are some unfortunate uh, help engine limitations, and uh, we didn't update default value. I'm not sure that it is possible. I think I when I looked into it, I found that we just don't have a right uh, way to get this value out. So you actually need to edit, like maybe default value is like the only one that you need to edit by hands. Good question. Um, okay, so let's just uh, really quickly, oops, use docs. Let's just really quickly output it. Let's import my module and uh, let's get help new greeting. Okay, so now we have both parameters here. Um, let me double check that it's all I want to talk about here. Yep. Okay, so and uh, now a bonus. Uh, because we use git, for version control. Uh, this is how diff looks like. Uh, let me just uh, create a temporary branch and uh, make a commit. Uh, demo. Uh, now diff should be empty. Oh, sorry, didn't specify M. Yeah, diff should be empty, and we should be on branch demo. Um, okay, so let's run update help one more time. And run git diff one more time. Okay, so you see here we, uh, we tried to run update and we made sure that uh, there is no diff between the previous state and current state. What it means is now you have a very simple test to uh, tell is your help out of date or not? Did you add any parameters or not? And uh, you, know, you can basically take this 
simple couple lines and you can uh, put it into your continuous integration pipeline and it will basically enforce that the help is always up to date. And uh, this is actually a theme of our next talk section. <coughs> So, yeah, uh, CI or continuous integration is great. You can leverage it, like, you know, the common way is to use uh, continuous integration to run tests and make sure all your tests are passing. But you can also use it in creative ways. Uh, for example, you can make sure the documentation is up to date. And I just showed you um, example, like example script, it's not like, uh, one liner, but it's maybe two lines to, to, to get it done. Uh, but uh, the even better part about it is that once your help is in markdown, now you can uh, leverage all this great work done by the uh, web development people who created uh, things like spell checking for markdown, created uh, hyperlinks checking. Um, so hyperlinks checking is very important. It's like my pet peeve. Uh, because what happens is, let's say you have like 100 markdown documents uh, and uh, you refactor them somehow, you like split or merge or rename something uh, and you have all these hyperlinks <coughs> rolling around and uh, part of them became invalid and you don't know until you like, right, until somebody reports it to you. So the, you can easily automatically test it. We've, uh, some scripting. And uh, spell check is also self-explanatory. Uh, and uh, this is what I just did as a demo. I set it up a repository pedantic CI demo. <clears throat> so it's probably one of the most pedantic uh, projects because <laughs> it will Make sure that you have your grammar correctly, it have your hyperlinks correctly, and that your help is up to date. Um, so let's take a look at it. Um, let's start with the code. This is our well-known friend, uh, New Greeting. Oh, sorry. Yep. Good catch. <coughs> So this is, uh, uh, I just put, put up this uh, docs pedantic CI demo repository. Uh, we have continuous integration page from Upware. So we will use Upware as a continuous integration system. Upware is, uh, I mean, it's like Jenkins, but it's hosted. So you don't need to care about where do you, you're going to host it. And it's also free for open source projects which is awesome and you know, for like demos especially, I highly recommend to use Upware. We'll take a look at it in a bit. Uh, but first, let's take a look at um, source code of our module. So we have our beloved uh, new greeting function. Uh, we've, in the old version, we've hard-coded hello. And uh, we have documentation for it in docs. This is actually, uh, yeah, I think it's the first time I'm showing you how the markdown, like rendered markdown looks on GitHub. So as far as I'm concerned, it looks pretty good. You can uh, use some static website builder to, pull, to make it, you know, to make styles as you see fit. You can build static website of markdown, but even as it is, even like simple, fa simple act of putting your help on uh, GitHub already gives you a pretty nice uh, experience for viewing. And uh, as a bonus fact, it is also uh, indexable by Google, so now people can actually find your help. <coughs> so like, I think it's good bank for a buck. Uh, and um, let's take a look at this Upware YAML file, which is actually describes the uh, continuous integration steps. 
So it, it's actually a YAML file, so we have YAML syntax. Uh, we will be mostly interested in this test script section, uh, but let's read it, the whole thing. So we just uh, installing some modules, uh, Platypus, obviously, Markdown link check, module to check the links, um, and we install some spell checker from NPM, from Node, because they have better, like I didn't find the PowerShell module for spell checking, so had to use Node. Um, that line just helpful for dealing with new lines, and uh, because I'm demoing on Mac and I use Windows for the continuous integration, it basically just takes care of that. <coughs> so we don't get uh, empty uh, diffs that contains just new lines. Uh, build script here, we don't build anything, we just import it in the section, uh, in the session. And uh, here is an interesting part. So the test script, uh, we have two or three steps. Uh, first, let's make sure that our help is up to date. We um, run update markdown help just as I did locally. We run git diff. Uh, and uh, then if GIF is non-empty, then we throw, and uh, we display in what's the diff in uh, update markdown help. So this is, uh, I just wanna bring your attention to this part because uh, it's, um, you know, a contributor coming and committing something in your repository, they should get some useful error messages, not just that everything failed. So please include, uh, as much information and error messages as you can. Um, the second part is very fine hyperlinks. Uh, I didn't talk much about this um, hyperlinks module, but basically you can uh, give it a folder and you can say broken only, and uh, if there are any broken links, it will return them. <coughs> uh, and uh, the last one is spell checker, so this is not PowerShell. So we just run uh, some uh, interesting command with a bunch of switches <clears throat> and uh, report basically makes it non-interactive, like by default it runs as an interactive command uh, and report just generates a general report and it uses uh, last exit code for, uh, it basically returns one if anything failed. Or maybe it's number of errors, don't remember. So, that with that, <coughs> let's actually take a look at pull requests now. So, uh, they all from me, but imagine that somebody sent the first one. Uh, and uh, this person had a brilliant idea to add a greeting into your code, but they didn't do anything about the help. So what happens next? Next, they get in this gigantic red crosses. And if you click on details, uh, you can open it. Uh, this is upware interface. And you see the whole log of things that happen. And the last one is right in your face, red error message and uh, it tells you run update markdown help and then some diff, well, it's not very well formatted, could be, could be formatted better, but it's something. Uh, okay, so now this person runs update markdown help and uh, sends a second pull request. And this time they actually, let's take a look at the diff. So we have the same diff here uh, we have basically syntax updated by update help and greeting and this person was really nice and specify uh, the description and replace the placeholder which people can often forget and this person even specify default value so he knows about this quirky box in Platypus. Uh, but he decided to be extra fancy and add related links section and uh, he made a mistake in uh, reference into readme. So now this link is actually broken. Uh, let's take a look how the continuous integration system will handle it. Uh, 
Well, sure enough, we have found broken hyperlinks and it actually gives us uh, all the information we need. It gives the file path, uh, URL, and line, and column. <coughs> um, okay, so now this person takes it one step further and uh, fixes the hyperlink. So right here we have readme. But uh, language is still misspelled. Uh, and sure enough, our continuous integration system can catch it. And uh, this is not very helpful error message, but if you look up, you can see that uh, it outputs the uh, line. Uh, when you run it locally, it actually highlights the word language uh, up where it loses this highlighting, so not as good as uh, it could be, but still something. Uh, and uh, the final accord is uh, uh, when the person fixes the uh, misspelled word. <clears throat> and uh, let's actually take a look at up where I was put anyway. You can see it's all green. But just to make sure, yeah, it says build success, succeeded. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's probably, I mean, like for some projects, it's maybe overkill to have like all this um, spell checking and whatnot. To be honest, like to make the spell checking works, you need to uh, add a huge uh, exclusion list, like whitelist, for <laughs> a lot of stuff. But uh, the PowerShell PowerShell repository uses this spell check, actually. Uh, you know, for like you, you can come up with other creative ways to verify that, like your, you know, maybe you like your markdown to be after it in a certain way. Like you don't like long, long lines. Like I don't like long lines personally. I basically ask everybody to always break it into smaller pieces uh, because it's easier for review. Uh, you can express all this. You can express all these constraints now in the continuous integration system. So another bonus fact, another bonus of using continuous integration in conjunction with documentation is that you don't have to tell people to do what you want them to do. You can make robots do them, uh, robots tell them what, what to do. And uh, like this is just a human nature. People really don't like to be told what to do, but uh, if it's a machine, then they're more willing to collaborate. So the lesson, if you want to introduce a new workflow in your organization, uh, don't be code Nazi. Just make some automation that enforces it and, you know, uh, introduce it this way. <clears throat> okay, so recap. Uh, with Platypus now, you can put your help online. You make it available. Uh, if you use GitHub for hosting of your help, it's a very, it's like basically free um, hosting solution. It gives you a very nice interface. Uh, that way you actually make it contributions friendly. And uh, this is one point I wanna talk about. Like even if you don't do open source, let's say you're doing some, uh, you know, proprietary software, uh, there is no point of keeping your documentation closed. You can just create a separate repository, put it online, uh, this is a cheap uh, hosting solution. Uh, you allow people contribute back. So if somebody spots a, a mistake or just a typo, they can contribute now. Um, so yeah, that's basically an approach that a lot of companies take. Uh, up to date, so your help can be up to date. You can enforce any kind of rules in Markdown you want. Uh, you can tailor it to your needs. Uh, maybe, you know, again, the spell checker is every kill for you, but uh, links are great. And uh, this is a list of projects that already use Platypus. Um, basically, the PowerShell docs is a core module. Uh, Azure PowerShell is uh, my personal favorite because that's how it all started. 
uh, basically my whole motivation was to make Azure PowerShell collaboration work good. Uh, PS Readline is the uh, first adopter of uh, Platypus. Big uh, kudos to Jason Shirk for being brave adopter. Uh, VS Team, uh, I just was uh, searching in GitHub who uses Platypus by some keywords, and uh, I'm actually not <laughs> sure what is v VS Team doing. I think it's TFS module, uh, but uh, they're pretty big. <coughs> and uh, the recent addition is Office PowerShell, which actually has thousands and thousands of commands. And uh, they use all the same tool chain that I described. They use GitHub, they use Platypus, they also use DocFX for the nicer website version, um, which you can also use. And uh, with that, I would like to ask you to join this list of great projects and give a Platypus a try. Uh, we, <coughs> yep. So with that, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the future of uh, PowerShell help documentation. So if you follow GitHub, you may see this uh, issue created by Steve Lee, who is a team lead on PowerShell team. <clears throat> and it says, help system should consume Markdown natively. And uh, if you follow another repository, PowerShell RFC, you may see another issue created by Aditya help system as a standalone PowerShell module. So I think you can see where it's all going. Uh, basically, there is a desire to uh, cut uh, man in the middle, cut this trans translation from markdown into um, external help. Because you don't really need it. You can just display markdown. If you, if you can render the same thing in console and then on the web, like why we have a whole transition story? So with that, it's basically uh, Platypus is not like a final destination in this journey. It's a stepping stone to basically provide a smooth transition to a better and more modern um, documentation tool chain for, for PowerShell. Uh, we can only do it if we all uh, start to, if we all converge on it, basically. If, uh, if we introduce it as a standard in the community and in Microsoft, then we can uh, hope for a better documentation story. Uh, if, if it doesn't get traction, then uh, it will be like the current state, which is also fine, but we can, we can do much better in my opinion. Um, so with that, thank you. Uh, I, we actually have a lot of time, so if you have any questions, that's a good time for us. Do you know what they, when they transfer to Markdown, are they going to backport that to older versions of PowerShell? Yes, yeah, so let's take a look at the uh, PowerShell docs. <coughs> it, it, it's already backported. Uh, oh, you mean, uh, okay, so. Like if they, when they switch over from MAML, yep. uh, is it going to be compatible with old PowerShell modules? Is it are, are going to make yeah, So uh, let me ask in two ways. So the question is, uh, if we go and translate to Markdown, uh, would it be backported? So I will answer in two parts. The first one is it's already backported in the sense of content. So let's take a look at the PowerShell, PowerShell docs. Uh, this is uh, core commandlets modules. And uh, it has obvious folder reference for everything. And then you can see the free zero, for example. You, you have all the content right here. Uh, and the second kind of building on this question is, uh, let's say that tomorrow we have some great way to display Markdown in the console in PowerShell. Uh, it can totally be a separate module downloadable from the gallery, right? Good question. Uh, the update help, how does the version uh, works, and where do you point out the source or where you download files from? Yep. That must be in the memo somewhere. Or... Yeah, exactly. So I conveniently have it right here. Um, this online version actually points 
Okay, uh, no, I not conveniently have it here. I conveniently have it right here. Management. Okay, right here. So uh, when you, if you want to leverage updatable help, you can uh, use what we call um, module like uh, module help basically it's a kind of table of content markdown file with uh, description of the whole module and then uh, basically links to all the single commandlets and uh, in this document you can specify download help link and uh, it, we basically try to make the flow of using updatable help as easy as possible so we have uh, new uh, external help cap, I guess, yeah. New external help cap, uh, which uh, takes care of packing everything in the right format. You just need to put it on the right URL after that. Yeah. Good question. Uh, when you have that uh, module page, it shows just, and you do that on, if you have an old project, and you do uh, uh, external help on that, and use that switch called, uh, with module page, you get a page very similar to that. Yep. And you still have to fill in the description for every command line. Oh, yeah, that could be better. We can pull up synopsis, right? If that's not been done yet, but it could be done. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's a great question because uh, I, what I would like to show you uh, is a place to, for such questions. Um, basically, on GitHub, oh my father. Uh, Mm. I see. Uh, yeah, maybe there exists an issue open for it. If not, then please open it. Uh, there are people in Microsoft who are working on it. Um, there are people in community who are working on it. And uh, I uh, did most of uh, development, but uh, don't have, uh, I, I'm not actively working at the moment. Uh, but the project is still developed, develops. And uh, yeah, please, uh, and you know, if you want to join, that would be fantastic. Basically, the, there is a, a jumpstart document in uh, contributing MD. Uh, it tell, you know, walks you through how to set up everything, and uh, it has a little bit of uh, kind of documentation about how development is done, uh, how the data transformation works, and that sort of things could be could could use a little bit of help, but yeah. Uh, so that's the beauty of open source. Please file in issues and uh, feel free to contribute. That would be awesome. I I, I continuously reviewing the pull requests, and uh, even when I don't do development actively myself, I'm uh, merging good contributions. So uh, in all of your examples here, you. Uh Converted um, either from new command, but um, in, in, uh, well, you, you used uh, the existing comment-based help um, to bootstrap the uh, the markdown uh, file. Is there one of the reasons I ask? Is I heard last year that writing in XML was or writing in the uh, markdown was better because ultimately you had your typos would you know potentially break the uh, the actual outputting of the help file. Do once you start using Platypus, do you move away from comment-based help? Yeah, great question. Uh, it's, I should actually be more explicit about it because it introduces a lot of confusion. So once you um, use bootstrap step and once you generate it markdown, you really should start treat it as a source of truth. Like that way you get the most value out of it. Uh, with that being said, I've seen people uh, keep using command-based help for the, for the help part and uh, treating Platypus as just a way to create a nice website uh, and put it on uh, GitHub wikis or somewhere. Uh, so that, that is valid and uh, I was really pleased to find that uh, you know, people find creative ways to use the tool. But the intended scenario is uh, once you convert, a, w w once you made a bootstrap, you just delete all your command-based help and start using Platypus. Because I could see why people would um, want to have the uh, help located alongside their code, but then at the same time, you've got, uh, you're basically 
and still doing it the old way when you're editing and using the comment-based help as the source of truth, and you're just giving yourself more overhead. I can see yeah. arguments for both ways, but you'd hope that ultimately yeah. you move to the other paradigm where you started, and you know, otherwise you'd probably be you know, duplicating your work or trying to come up with some way to generate comment-based help off of your markdown, which really seems backwards. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that probably wouldn't work. Uh, yeah, there are uh, you know bonuses of both of them, but uh, I think the right angle to look at it is you write your help not for convenience of yourself to look at it. You write it for your customers. Uh, is it a good experience to look at the help by reading the source code? Like, I think you know if we if we go that way, we can just uh, throw away the whole uh, help framework and just add commands in the code, and that's good enough, right? So. Like naturally, you want to focus on consuming your help by other people. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, in the early days, I think there was this tool where when you pointed to a module, it would tell you uh, what's uh, essentially missing the documentation. So if there are new parameters, you might so on. And I guess one of the reasons for having the XML is that you could essentially treat it as data and discover these. And your proposal to discover what is, um, let's say, missing documentation is to do a diff. Yep. See if there is a diff. Uh, yeah, it will tell you what's missing. But uh, if, let's say, uh, if diff is more like a developer tool, mm -hmm. and if I force a tech writer to do that, I'm not sure if they will actually yeah. understand what <laughs> Yeah. So, is there a way, kind of, to uh, uh, have the source of truth as a markdown uh, and essentially have it converted into some object model so you could even right. present it more user friendly? Yeah, uh, totally. And um, you know, we really spend a lot of time just making sure that. We don't like asking for too much, and we have like good stories of backward compatibility. Uh, so one way, I mean, there are a couple ways to approach it. One would be to uh, use new external help, and it creates the XML for you, and then you can uh, you can use actually get a help preview to get the object model. This is uh, like I didn't show it, but uh, it, it returns the object, right? And uh, it's the same object as get help return, so that's pretty neat, and you can diff it. Uh, another way to go about it would be to uh, what we implemented for Microsoft Tech Writers, and uh, in update markdown help, there is a log path, and you can actually give it uh, you know, some file name, and it will write to best its, its ability some uh, trace of what happened exactly. So you don't need to look at the git diff. That way, you can just look at the log path, and uh, from that, you can deduce what changed. Yeah. Thank you for the question. All right, so uh, I think we will just wrap up a little bit early, and uh, I will be today at the summit. If you have questions you want to ask in person, hit me up. Thank you.